If the yogi persists with internal meditation constantly and with infinite patience, then within a period of time, clairvoyant perceptions will begin to develop. In the early stages of development, luminous spots will appear. Later, as the development continues, faces and objects and pictures of nature will appear. Objects will seem dreamlike, as in the moments of transition between vigil and dream. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 7 in this series on Awakening the Chakras. We'll now cover the most talked about, generalized, misunderstood, misused, miss everything chakra. Uh, The third eye chakra, Ajna, the Church of Philadelphia, with the element being light, spiritual inner light, hence the imagery visuals and clairvoyance. This chakra is located in the pituitary gland, sometimes related to the pineal gland, but since these two glands are so close together in the brain and also very intimately connected, spiritually and biologically, we don't need to focus about which is right or wrong. In this episode, we will understand it as the pituitary gland, going with the Gnostic teachings. The pineal gland will be covered in the episode after this one, when we look at the crown chakra. This episode will mainly cover clairvoyance, and will do an interesting practice to help you get started as well. I'll also release a guided meditation video this week to help you develop the silence of the mind a bit better, beyond the stream of the ego, which is so important to be rooted in, in order to understand the direct reality of the third eye in a more fundamental way. And in a way, it's more efficient for me to show you through guided meditation rather than just these intellectual discourses that we're going through. Both are important, but ultimately practice is more necessary in order to embody these teachings in a more profound and deeper way in our consciousness. So be sure to give this video a like as it helps the channel and I've been getting a lot of questions throughout this series as you've probably noticed. I do love reading and responding to your comments and questions but there's just been so many that I've not been able to get round to all of them and it seems there's glitches sometimes where I don't even see the comments. So if you really have some pressing questions you'd love me to answer in depth, uh, consider joining on Patreon, which also supports the channel. Amongst those questions, I also noticed quite a few asking, how long does it take for a chakra to be unblocked? Well, that totally depends on the individual and their inner understanding of the causes of such blockages that comes with time and natural arising of inner understanding and intuition through your spiritual practice. If you practice intensely, you will awaken more intensely. Practice more consistently and you will awaken more consistently. And also, it's not exactly effective or efficient to expect results quickly or something. Remember that the awakening of consciousness is a gradual path throughout our entire life. So accordingly, your chakras grow in power throughout your life too, of course. Abilities are not an on and off switch. It's multidimensional. It's a flowering. Each petal on the chakra flowers in time according to when you're ready. You know, sometimes you'll see people say, my third eye has opened. Well, sorry, but no, you're wrong. It's not open. You should be more specific. It's partially opened or begun to open. It's just a tiny little squint of an eye, a tiny bit of light cracking through a wall. There's still a lot of growth to do to destroy the rest of the wall that's blocking the light. And as we'll see in this episode, which you'll hopefully understand, 
Those who say they are awakened are not in fact awakened, because if they were awakened, they would understand that an awakened person never says they are awakened, because an awakened person is awakened to the fact of how much they are asleep. It's only by realizing how much you are truly asleep that you start to get a chance to really gradually awaken in a real way. But even then, awakening becomes a practice, not something that is an end result, a climax, right? Or an achievement. We always want to get to the climax. We always want to get to the end goal of things. But this is not really the way when it comes to spiritual awakening. So in this sense, there is no such thing as an awakened being. There is only awakening beings. An enlightened life or an awakened life is active, action, a beating heart, an endless fire, not an end goal. Not a comfortable spot where we are <laughs> chilling, right? No mental identification with a mere idea. No identification with anything. It is life itself. Identification with ideologies is the opposite to living a spiritual life. That's why awakened beings never say that they are awakened. Identification is death, not life not consciousness. Okay, so the third eye. This is a very simple matter, actually, but the craze about it sends us off into all sorts of theories about how amazing it would be if we literally had a third eye where we see all these amazing visions. It can be like that, but let's be more grounded. And we imagine it to be this amazing superpower, and the reality is we already do have that. But as repeated throughout this series, we're just so asleep. Our consciousness is so unaware that we lack the discernment of our perception from moment to moment to realize our natural abilities and the perceptions that arise within us all the time throughout our day. As well as the fact that, of course, our abilities are essentially broken, atrophied. You see, we all have our mind's eye, right? We can see through it very easily and you use it all the time. If I describe to you the three pyramids of Giza now, their shape, their colour, their size, most of you will be able to see them in your mind's eye very easily, instantaneously. No effort. It comes very naturally. And, you know, if you struggle to do that, well, it just means you're not used to using your imagination in a conscious way. Some people say they have, you know, aphantasia or something. You know, it's only because you've essentially abused your natural imaginative abilities uh, quite heavily whether through strong negative emotions, such as thinking about how much you hate someone all day, or using things such as pornography and visualizing all the sexual fantasies that you'd like to fulfill. Those are just some examples, and we'll see more examples, of how you use the third eye's ability to visualize. So you'll find that a lot of people who say they don't know how to visualize are actually visualizing all the time, but they just can't seem to do it when they want to use it consciously because they're way too used to using it unconsciously. So we're going to see some examples of how we are always using this ability. And through understanding that, we can get in touch with our nature, our inner faculty for seeing things with our third eye, with our inner eye. So you must understand that anything which involves visualization, fantasy, imagination, involves using your third eye's natural ability. We use it all the time. More simple examples would be when you lose your keys or your phone, then you try and imagine where you last placed them. 
or when you think about directions when traveling somewhere, you use your imagination to direct yourself to walk or drive into that direction. So if you've ever walked in a direction and you know the way, then you have visualization. I'm sorry, but aphantasia, I know a lot of, I get a lot of questions about it. It's not as a solidified thing within you than you think. Don't make the mistake of identifying with you have aphantasia because that's just another thing blocking you. I've helped many people with aphantasia and quite a few of them have with practice been able to understand how to start visualizing more consciously again. And notice how when people try to remember or think about something, they look up because they're instinctively trying to connect to this chakra. Because when we look up with our physical eyes, we're getting in touch with that energy of the higher chakras in our head. Similarly, notice how we shake our heads when we're engrossed in daydreaming and we suddenly snap out of it. You know, we're shaking our head, we're trying to wake up our imagination to be here and now, right? For you to look around the room or wherever you are now listening to this, you know, look around you right now, you are using your imagination. You are using your third eye. Really look around wherever you are right now. Try to notice things in your room or wherever you are that you've never noticed in this location before. You never noticed it because of a lack of power in your imagination. Someone with a pure and bright imagination notices everything, every little detail of where they are. You know, it doesn't have to be absolutely everything, but they certainly remember a lot more than someone who is asleep. And since we're all always daydreaming asleep in our own consciousness, we barely take the time to look around where we are. For some reason, we much rather stay in the fantasies that our ego feeds us always dreaming about the future or worrying about the past. Uh, so kind of relatedly, you may have felt tingling sensations in your third eye area during moments of profound meditation or deep intuitive understanding of something. This is felt between and above the eyebrows. This is simply activity of the third eye, nothing too special, it just means you're healthy, you have a sufficient amount of prana flowing there, and you have some, you know, healthy energy there. It's good, it's a good thing. Nothing you need to worry about, nothing you need to get fascinated by, it's simply the activity of your third eye. Most people who are into spiritual practices feel this at some point. Now, the word clairvoyance is from French, which means clear seeing, or to see beyond, to see clearly. Now, this clear seeing is important to understand because we currently do not see clearly. Our inner seeing is impure, it's misused, imbalanced contaminated. So we need to transform it. In other words, we need to transform and purify our imagination. To talk more harshly, we've destroyed our imagination with overwhelming stupidity. And it's our fault, but also the result of an endless cycle throughout centuries of regurgitated idiocy, which is force-fed to us from the moment we're born by our stupid parents, stupid TV, stupid schools, stupid friends, stupid governments, stupid education, and the list goes on. Modern society is an excellent manufacturer of producing the universe's greatest idiots. And this Idiocy is our conditioning, which runs so profoundly deep into the depths of our unconscious. The brainwashing is so great, nobody even notices it. And we think that the world is this great enemy to be overcome, to battle and get rid of all these wars and fight against all the bad guys, when really we 
are the main villain in our story of awakening. We are the main person that we need to defeat. So the phrase, the blind leading the blind, is a huge understatement. We are, as human beings, with these abilities that are used in such the wrong way, we are capable of so much more than this. But all of that energy of capability has been locked away through the power of conditioning, of beliefs. And it's not just a case of simply saying, to get over them, I'm going to say, I believe in this, or I believe in that. No, to change your beliefs takes serious and sincere devotion and decision in the heart to unravel those energetic knots, to untie the coiled sleeping serpent of kundalini at the base of the spine. This is a real work. It's not just a matter of saying a few affirmations and thinking that we are Harry Potter and a few waves of our wand is going to give us some magic in life. It's a matter of real devotion in the heart, consistent practice to change deeply. And so you might say, oh, Jean, okay, there's some conditioning, but overall, I feel like I'm awakened. I'm not really doing that much to myself. <laughs> no, we truly do not grasp how mechanical, how asleep, how dangerously blind we are, completely hypnotized by the mundane dream of our life, stuck in our own delusional psychosis, comfortable with where we are and not wanting to move out of it, comfortable because we think we are right. The ego thinks that it knows when it does not, but we do not even know that we do not know. And that's a big problem. And so when people begin to wake up to this fact and are scared by it, only then do people begin to seek some form of awakening. That's why spirituality is generally not for happy people. The most authentic spiritual people come from a background of suffering, of an existential crisis, of hardship, turmoil, and pain and suffering. Only then is when people really seek the true answers. And so really all that happens when you begin to awaken is realize even more just how much you are not awakened. Hence the real path of spirituality is not for the faint-hearted. It's not a nice thing. It's painful to see how stupid you are, to see how truly lost and blind you are, to see your evilness and ugliness and how you are the fault of all of your own misery in every single way. It's nobody else's fault. So it's not a pleasant thing, right? But it's the only worthwhile thing doing. Much better than taking the easy option, which is to stay in the comfort of your own delusional, dreamlike psychosis, you lose your soul through that. Or better said, you never develop a soul in the first place. Uh, if you've just found this video without watching the series and previous episodes on Awakening the Chakras from episode one, uh, you may want to uh, go back a bit uh, because, you know, I'm talking about the ego and awakening from its illusions of reality and our false sense of self and false identifications. Uh, we covered some of this in the previous episodes and there are many great resources, free resources available in the descriptions of those videos. So I'm just giving you a taste really of the gravity of how much we truly do not know, and this is very important to connect with, especially when we're interested in developing things such as clairvoyance. Because as we're going to see, discernment between egoic perceptions and reality is crucial to understand. There's two types of clairvoyance, subconscious clairvoyance and objective clairvoyance. Now, we'll see this as we carry on. 
So clairvoyance really is just a fancy word to say a form of intuition. And I've been speaking more abstractly here because in order to understand what I'm saying, you have to use your intuition. You know, are you just being a consumer of spiritual videos or are you really listening with the intent to understand intuitively here and now in your heart and applying this to your own spiritual experience and knowledge to actually have spiritual realizations and movements within you as you listen? Those who are really hungry, like a lion, listen to spiritual teachings again and again, and each time they do, new layers, new dimensions of comprehension unfold. So clearly, one set of information, whether it's a book or video, doesn't just have the information in the words, but is found through the intuitive faculties of our being as we read them. And one of the most powerful and developed forms of intuition is our third eye. Remember that previously I spoke about other forms of intuition, such as our emotions and clairaudience. Well, since the fire of Kundalini develops upwards, endowing us the gifts of our inner nature, we slowly begin to sort of distill our intuition into more refined ways. And one of those more refined ways is our third eye. It is a form of intuition where we receive impressions of things in the form of mental images. We literally see them. Notice next time you're watching someone daydreaming or fantasizing about something, you can see that they are literally looking at something in another world and they may even be reacting to those things in their facial expressions. And that's, of course, what we could call subconscious clairvoyance, simply just looking into the world of dreams, disconnected from reality. But when we cleanse that subconscious clairvoyance, it connects to reality. So this is a very developed form of intuition, which of course requires a lot of internal purification and discernment first, related to all the things we talked about in the previous episodes and more. You know, the more powerful an ability is, the more our ego wants to steal it and use it for its own desires, its own selfishness. Hence why the third eye is the most misused and misunderstood chakra there is, because we abuse it the most with our ego. Our ego uses it to see what it wants to see in order to fool the rest of our system, the rest of our consciousness into what we want or how we should believe reality or how we should feel about our experiences, etc. For example, if we asked a room of people, or I ask all of you now, what do you think God looks like? Do you think he's real? Immediately, each one of you, to a certain degree, without really being conscious of it, will begin to receive mental impressions. And the third eye is so powerful, we're so identified with it, so under its spell, that when we receive those impressions, we believe that to be our highest reality, especially if we are sort of opinionated people. Because our inner eye cannot see the world any other way, because that's how we unconsciously set up our understanding and imagination to be. So obviously that does not apply to everyone, I'm, I'm talking about the general populace. So this is the meaning of what it means to be closed-minded. Open-minded means that you are at least, to a degree, aware of your own conditioning and aware that the usual hypnosis that your imagination feeds you is not necessarily the truth. You see, most people, let's use a generalization of skeptical people who hail modern science as the greatest truth, such people, if you ever talk to them, certain individuals, can get very angry when someone expresses a reality different to theirs because they're closed to only one idea very firmly that is 
lodged very deeply in their mind's eye, not realizing that it's just an idea, and they don't realize that there are realities and ideas that exist beyond the confines of that tiny part of their imagination that's holding on to that little idea or set of ideas. So the phrase, seeing is believing, is very relevant here. People's minds are closed to the ideas that they identify with for whatever reason, and they believe it because they see it with their mind's eye. So the moment you think you know something, your eyes are closed. You put a full stop on intelligence. You put a full stop on reality. A halt on your own active perception. What a sad thing to think we know reality. Instead of letting reality unfold and live through us from moment to moment. You know, I noticed some comments of people calling me a master or something. Well, as I just said, and, you know, just to say, I'm not a master, okay? I'm a student learning just like all of you. I will never identify as a master who has achieved or attained anything. Because I know as soon as I do, I close myself from learning. The path is infinite, my friends, even beyond death. Don't let the spiritual ego think itself of being enlightened or awakened in any regard. Just practice. That's all you need to do to reach the long lengths of the path. Don't get stuck or tempted by one nice little island in the middle of nowhere that has a nice little throne for you to sit on. It's just a mirage, maya, an illusion of ego identification. But that's the nature of the ego, right? But, you know, Gene, don't say that. I need to get somewhere. I need an end goal. I need something to latch on to. No. Psychological death is the way. Death, death, death. Throughout our day, all the time. And that's it. If you don't like it, then maybe spirituality is not for you. Now, in order to start to become aware of the usefulness of the third eye, we have to begin to pay attention to its activity. This is all part of spiritual practice and becoming more present in our lives, deeply. Some people say that they are present all the time. And as soon as they say it, I, I understand that, okay, they are probably lacking some presence in their life because they think they are being present. Presence can always be deepened. So again, I'm repeating, never think you are present, just be present. It's a practice every single moment. And so when we come to this uh, practice with the third eye, you have to pay attention to the images that are sent into your blank canvas of your mind, so to speak. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention to all of the movements in the mind. Anything that arises is worth paying attention to. It's worth noticing. Don't worry if you're doing things in your physical life too. We weren't given this great brain. We weren't given these powers of the gods to just be mere monkeys who are only able to do one thing at a time. We are capable of doing many things at the same time. It just takes practice, relaxation, and confidence. You are fully able of being internally illuminated of all the movements of your mind while doing many things in your physical life too. It takes practice, that's all. And if you begin to pay attention through the foundation of what we've been discussing in the previous episodes about inner silence, you'll start to notice many things, all sorts of noise and rubbish. It's fine. But amongst all of that, and as you become more refined and more subtle and more precise in your perceptions, one of those things you may perceive is that you just may notice things happening before they happen. 
And there's many other things you may notice, we'll, which I'll give more examples as we continue. You see, usually beginners in spirituality just devote five or ten minutes a day to some kind of, you know, mediocre meditation. Then once they finish, they go back to the patterns of their ordinary lives and they don't have any conscious attention or intention at all. So what was the point of meditating for 10 minutes if that awareness is not going to aid you and is not going to spill over into the rest of your life? Many sort of advanced practitioners make this mistake too. So with time, of course, and practice, we're able to bring that sense of awareness to the inner canvas of our mind's eye with us throughout our day. No matter how mundane we may think certain moments are, whether we're at work talking to colleagues or family or doing chores or getting groceries, we can bring an intense awareness with us wherever we go. And it enriches your life, very much so, which I know many of you have noticed throughout this series. It's enriching your life. It's deepening it in many ways. Life does not have to be mundane. A simple walk down the road that you've walked down for many years can suddenly become deeply interesting and profound. And so when we bring this awareness to our everyday activities, we're able to notice a lot of interesting phenomena that we wouldn't usually if we weren't paying attention. These perceptions, these phenomena happen extremely quickly. There's no judgment, there's no translation, no thinking, they just happen and you don't have to stop what you're doing to analyze them, you just need to become aware of them and that's it. For example, you're sitting on your sofa watching television and you just have a very quick image in your mind's eye that a family member is about to walk down the stairs and then they do walk down the stairs. Obviously, you just foresaw that. Great, nothing special, it's natural. Like I said, we just don't notice that we perceive these things. Also notice when you speak to people, especially for the first time, the kinds of impressions you get from them. Obviously, we have a lot of conditioning in terms of us generalizing and stereotyping people based on their appearances, but after doing certain inner purifications, you know, you become a less judgmental person, a less conditioned person through spiritual practice, and eventually you'll be able to latch on to more objective impressions that you receive through your mind's eye, which is a sort of antenna which receives these signals. And so when you meet someone, you could receive thoughts such as this person is feeling a certain way, they have certain intentions, motives, they're thinking about a certain thing, uh, they're a smoker, uh, they own a dog, uh, they like computers, or this person is a very active sporty person, or perhaps very intellectual, or emotional, or compassionate. There's so many impressions that our imagination receives, especially when we go to new places or meet new people. And so if our imagination is pure, we can receive these more objective psychic perceptions. Now, if you're a little stuck at this point, I really do recommend perhaps pausing, uh, you know, if you're struggling to understand all of this, and uh, just check out the resources that I'm going to leave in the description below, and uh, hopefully this will all make sense a bit better. But to continue, another benefit of having a purified third eye is that uh, when we're making decisions about things in life, whether they're mundane or important decisions, we can see the right decision we should make, and we don't even have to think about it. It's very quick. And so we're able to see what will happen if we make a certain decision, and we see it very quickly through the intuition of the third eye and its imaginative intelligence. Okay, the word imagination obviously is another overused and misunderstood word, like the word love and like the word God. We're talking about a different type of imagination here. 
Okay. Which, of course, is also covered in the articles I've left below. And, for example, you also may decide to bring up a certain topic to someone or a group of people. And if you're not awakened in those moments to the impressions within you, you may not perceive that what you're about to say is going to offend someone or cause a lot of unwanted problems perhaps some arguments. However, if your third eye was open consciously in those moments, you would have seen that it wasn't a good idea to bring up whatever topic you did, and therefore you wouldn't have said it in the first place. This is how our ego of perhaps pride can get in our way because our ego wanted to say something for its own perhaps vanity. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we always don't make decisions that involve conflicts or arguments. It just may mean we make a firmer and more well-informed decision from our intuition and go more ahead with that conflict in the name of our truth or heart decision. And we're also able to resolve the conflict more efficiently by foreseeing what kind of conflict is going to arise. And similarly, sometimes it's not a matter of whether or not to bring up certain issues to certain people, but sensing whether it is the right time to do it and sensing whether that person is in the right frame of mind for them to receive whatever you want to tell them, and then also sensing how to best translate it for them. This is all the gifts and intuitiveness and intelligence that the third eye chakra is able to help us with. So, you know, it helps us to become even more greater communicators and also helps us to learn information faster. Because seeing information visually can ground a lot of understanding deeply, quite fast. It's the reason why watching videos is so popular, because people today want information very quickly and images and videos can express multitudes of information compared to simply reading or listening to something. But of course, again, another reason why we watch videos is because our imagination is atrophied and we sort of need technological stimuli as a crutch for that. This is why reading is actually more deeper, more powerful, as it encourages you to use your own imagination instead of relying on videos. And, you know, to sort of come off topic a little bit, some people ask, why don't extraterrestrials reveal themselves already? Well, because they're not stupid, they're more awakened, they can see that we wouldn't understand, and they're not selfish or self-centered or irresponsible enough to just do something that careless. So, similarly, each person you speak to, you connect to their unique inner world, and you can see how you can navigate through their world, through your own empathy, through your own clairvoyance, in order to best translate your ideas to them. This is the most powerful form of communication and relationship and communion, right? So it's not about speaking your truth all the time, but perceiving where and when and who it's relevant for and also how to translate it for each person to the best of your intuitive capability. I'm just mentioning that because, you know, I think we've all more or less made this mistake when we first, uh, quote-unquote, awakened, right? Blurting out all of the profound realizations we came to, uh, telling all the people we know about it who simply have no idea or simply don't care about it. And it's funny because we're shouting to people about how awakened we are, but we're not awakened enough to perceive that it's absolutely counterproductive to talk to most people about it most of the time. 
So remember that in order to see with the third eye, without ego, we need to utilize the heart center too. Love is the way to see beyond conflict and duality. Our eyes have two eyes because of duality. Our heart has one eye. And the third eye is also one eye. So love is the way to see beyond conflict and duality and through the door of non-judgmental, neutral understanding. This is to see without the presence of the psychological I, the me, the ego, without the opinions and personal preferences of your own individual personality. It is to Use your third eye while denying yourself through the heart, through psychological death. This is sort of what it means to embody in our practices sacrifice for humanity. And in doing so, we are able to connect to the fundamental reality, to the ultimate reality of life, which has its roots in inner silence. And through this more silent, intelligent intuition, we can also better observe and understand our psychology deeper and see how certain parts of ourselves negatively affect ourselves and others. We can literally see with our mind's eye all of our defects and our weaknesses more clearly and from more perspectives when we develop this chakra. So again, it awakens according to how much you are ready to see. Because, as I said at the start of this episode, we like to think of awakening as something uh, beautiful, and it usually is, if you are, you know, a heart-centered person. Uh, But down the line, in more advanced practices, we begin to also cut down on the more deeper parts within us that really need a deep clean, and that's usually not a pleasant thing. On greater and more developed abilities of the third eye, we can begin to perceive things beyond our personal life. Master Samuel Aoun Veor told a story that a fire was about to start in a building near him, and he was able to see it before it happened. This is really where the ideas from superhero stories, where heroes sense things before they happen, come from. And then they are able to try and help the situation in some way. In other ways, the third eye becomes useful in also comprehending the heights of divine truths. For example, if you want to connect to Atman, God, Brahma, Ayin Sof, well then meditate on these things with a controlled and pure imagination and through intending to comprehend such things, your imagination will work in a way to give you information in the form of visions. And of course, such experiences are the result of a lot of purification and consistent meditation. And then, of course, we can experience very profound visuals during meditation. We may see certain masters, angels, and other higher beings. And when you see them like this, it isn't just merely visuals, but you understand what you're seeing directly. And it becomes a whole bodied comprehension of visual stimuli that awakens universal wisdom within us. You know, many people can look at a painting, but each one of us can draw our own wisdom from it. That's similar to what we can experience in meditation, but a lot more intensely. And the more we begin to purify the chakra and start to see objective truths and realities, we begin to understand that it's only through the purity of compassion that we see people more clearly. You know, it's not that we should be compassionate for the sake of just being nice or virtuous, but that compassion is a state of perceiving truth. It's through compassion for others that bypasses egoic filters of judgment. 
So this is very important when it comes to using the perceptions of the third eye when thinking about other people. And we talked about this a bit in the previous episode about clairaudience. Remember, there are many layers of subconscious filters we have to become aware of. Actually, in Gnosticism, we understand this as the subconscious being the first layer, then there's the unconscious, and then there's the infraconscious, where the darkest parts of ourselves lie. And it's through these filters of sub and un and infraconsciousness that we perceive reality. We translate reality through this subconsciousness. And so spiritual practice becomes very important for us on the path. It helps us as a navigation tool and to give us power to break through these filters sometimes. And, you know, compassion is just one of those powerful ways that we can try to at least bypass these many subconscious walls that are in our way of perceiving the ultimate reality. So these are tools to at least try and sense the truth of things. And practicing compassion for all beings is just one of those powerful lines of connection that we can connect to when trying to connect to reality. And we should especially practice this for people we would usually judge or have some kind of bias towards. So to clarify a little, we perceive imagery in accordance with our conditioning because our consciousness is trapped within the subjective mind which makes up most of what we are. In other words, the ego. Another example is we may be perhaps talking to our boss at work and in accordance with our own conditioning, we interpret our boss's behavior through that conditioning. And so therefore, we react to that interpretation even though it isn't necessarily true. So if our boss says something to us, gives us feedback about our work, perhaps we react and become irritated or angry, or worse, we lash out at our boss, and we're only doing that because of our wrong interpretation, which is usually because of some kind of pride or some kind of fear or paranoia that our boss doesn't like us or something or is just out to get us or something. And whether or not that's true, if we only ever interpret reality through our egos, then we will only ever react accordingly and we suffer, having the same experience in every job we get into. This is absolutely related to clairvoyance because in the moment we received those impressions of our boss behaving in a certain way, those sensations of the experience are received by our senses and then are translated by our own conditioned mind which is controlled by the ego. So if our pride or our shame or our fear or jealousy receives those images, then we react according to that conditioning. Those egos perceive images clairvoyantly. However, this is what we call in Gnosticism an inferior type of clairvoyance. In other words, fantasy. It is subconscious clairvoyance, not objective clairvoyance. And it's all hard to admit or realize, and we might think, you know, we're not fantasizing at all. Uh, but as I said earlier, it all happens so quickly that we don't even realize it. It all happens on a very subtle level, which is made worse through our mechanical and habitual way of being. It requires a great deal of awareness to see, to catch these things in the moment. And in order to do that, we also have to practice not being identified with the reactions of the mind, to not live off impulses mechanically. Okay, so, you know, the ego loves to take our dreams or visions and interpret them according to its own desires. This is why we learn to practice meditation. The basis of meditation practice is to learn how to discriminate 
between our being and ego, between consciousness and fantasy. Hence why I'll do a meditation in a few days, because it's all good, me saying all of this, but we need to practice, right? We need to learn how to not think. We are so engrossed in the constant stream of thinking, and most of us have never separated ourselves from that incessant stream, and we become like a fish who isn't aware of the existence of water, water being thoughts, because it's been submerged in it its whole life since it can remember. It's only when it learns to rise above the surface does it realize there's a different dimension to life. There's a different type of intelligence to life beyond the insanity of the ego and thinking. And through that intelligence, through that spaciousness and quietude, are we able to observe inner phenomena without thought? with a silent mind. There's nothing more gratifying in life than a silent mind when you can attain it. And so this is how we should approach becoming, you know, psychics. We have to be like innocent babies with no predispositions, just purity, just silence, no judgments about anything, any topic, anyone. If we live our lives submerged in the water and identified with our pride, fear, jealousy, competitiveness, caring about what other people think of us, then in meditation, those predispositions will determine how we perceive things. And when we receive mental imagery, we will interpret them through our pride, fear, jealousy, vanity, and all of those things. Hence, to dissolve the ego is to purify our clairvoyance. And this is just, as I've been saying throughout this series, this is the crux of awakening kundalini, to purify and dissolve the ego. And let our natural spirit express itself in harmony with its reality. Okay, so again, be sure to see the resources in the description if you want to deepen your understanding of all of this, as I want to now move on to the practices, since we have a few to look at, and we'll do a specific one together, which is essentially a clairvoyance exercise, which will allow us to see the tatwas the elements in our environment as discussed in the previous episodes. And then, of course, I will release a guided meditation, which I'll publish in a few days, based on all of what we've been talking about in this episode, and to help us to connect with non-thinking, with inner silence. So before I get on to that tatwa practice, let's look at two mantras. The first one is the main vowel for awakening the third eye, which is the letter I. It's pronounced E, not E, like the throat chakra, but like so. E. Focusing on the third eye, between and above the eyebrows. So we're going to chant that in the guided meditation that we're going to have this week. I want to focus more on inner silence, so I won't do the chanting for too long. Uh, You know, we will do what we've been discussing throughout this series, which is first physical relaxation, then pranayama, then a mantra, and then we will go into a more deeper meditation. Now, the next mantra is proeoa, 
This can be chanted with the combination of intending to perceive anything you want. Now, of course, it's a bit more of a advanced mantra. And if you've been successful with personal transformation, becoming, you know, the best version of yourself, you've been practicing and purifying your own sexuality, observing yourself throughout your day and noticing your dreams, then doing this mantra may be more effective for you, okay? So it all adds up, all of the things that we've been exploring in this series. So yes, you can use this mantra to perceive anything you want. Obviously, if you're intending to see or spy on people or something, then as we've been exploring, there is a law of universal karma and you probably will either not see anything or worse, you'll be impeded on your path. You'll probably go through some kind of suffering in, or in order to learn something. So to continue, we can perceive anything, whether it be a faraway place in the physical or whether we want to see a master, an angel, or if we want to see something in the astral plane or mental plane, etc. So you could say this is a form of remote viewing, but a little more powerful in the sense that we can use it to see within other dimensions too. So it can be pronounced like this. Pro Placing your intention to see what you want to see. Pro Again, just like any of the mantras throughout this series, you can chant them mentally if you prefer as well. And this mantra can also be used as you go to sleep. So you sort of lull yourself to sleep with it, with the intention of whatever you want to see. And then perhaps in the middle of the night, you will have an experience connecting with your intention or you will wake up and recall something to do with what you wanted to see, what you wanted to explore or investigate or find out. Now, as we've been seeing with the tatwas, they are the spiritual etheric elements around us in nature. This simple practice I'm going to show you now will allow you to see what tatwas are in your environment wherever you are. This is one of the first Gnostic practices that my teacher showed me and I was able to be successful with it the first time. So I'm sure a lot of you will be successful with it too. It's very simple. Don't think about it, just uh, you know, follow my instructions. And when we do it, you will see these tatwas as colours, different colours swirling in front of you while your eyes are closed. So before we begin, let's review the colours and a little bit about their meanings. And note that uh, when we do the exercise, you may be able to see more than one colour. So Prithvi, the earth element, the earth tatwa is yellow. If you see this colour, it means that this element of earth is active around you. It may mean, you know, it's a good time to do earthly things, to eat, to do business, to do some exercise, uh, to do something with your partner, friendship, uh, appointments and business, academic, social appointments, social gatherings, all are good ideas and is usually a success when this element is around us in the environment. Uh, apas, the water element, the water tatua is white. If you see this colour, it's a good time for making investments, 
Uh, it's a good time for business. Um, it's good for traveling and generally things to do with the law of attraction. You are able to attract things to you a bit better. So it can also be to do with uh, relationships and love and romance as well. Tejas, the fire tatua, is red. If you see this color, it's a good time to take a cold shower if you're ill and you'll be cured or, you know, you will just never catch a cold. Uh, you should also avoid arguments of all kinds during this time if you see this color because if you get into an argument while the fire tatua is around, then those arguments usually end very badly. So you should be careful around people and especially with close family members, uh, such as your spouse. Uh, and lots of accidents can happen during this time as well, so it's a good idea to be careful generally. Uh, and it's also a good idea to do more intense spiritual practices if you see this color. So more vigorous practices such as uh, vigorous types of pranayama is a good idea. Vayu, the air tatwa, is blue. If you see this color, also be careful of people again because their thoughts may be more swayed to think wrongly or badly of you or just general people. People tend to overthink during this time, so it's usually not a good time to travel. It's a good time to do intellectual work which requires, you know, intellectual focus, whether it's studying or reading or any other kind of academic work or research. Akash, the ether tatwa, is black. If you see this color, it basically only means or only has one purpose. It's exclusively good for meditation and prayer. As we saw in the previous episode, do the exercise I'm going to show you on how to see the tatwas during sunrise, and you will usually see black swirling in your vision, a jet black. Um, so during this time, uh, doing things like business, love, friendships, and other activities of mundane life generally may not go well during this time, and a lot of mistakes can be made. So if you see this color and you're working, then you should be careful not to make any mistakes, whether you're a student, an artist, a business person, because Akash is the tatwa of death. Hence, it's a time for stillness, meditation, introspection, okay? And, you know, use your own intuition related to what we've been studying about the elements and the chakras throughout this series, okay? So these spiritual elements, these colors around us can be checked by us very quickly once you get the hang of this exercise I'm about to show you. And it's important to note that some elements may be present for perhaps some hours and some may stay for days. And so if you enjoy this practice, you can do it quite often. And depending on the colors that you see, you can start to get your own intuition about what kind of things you should do during what kind of colors you see around you. And you'll get a sense for, you know, depending on what country you're in and your, your surrounding environment, what kind of tattoos are the most active and how long they last. Okay, I'll show you how to do them now. Okay, so... Hello everyone, uh, I can't really show you this practice without me just demonstrating it for you on camera. It's just a lot more effective, uh, even though it is quite simple, uh, it's a little bit difficult to describe, so here I am. And uh, actually there are a lot of practices, a lot of spiritual exercises that I've been wanting to share on this channel for a while. Uh, things such as the Nordic runes, they are full of exercises, um, certain meditative and bodily movements that involve certain prayers and 
many things, uh, such as healing as well. So yes, hopefully this is the first of many that I can show you and you can finally put a face to the voice. So that is probably due by now. This is my first video of me and it's already been almost a year now, I think. Uh, I've been making these videos every week, so yes. Okay, so let me show you this uh, practice uh, to see the tatwas, okay? And yes, what you need is a desk in front of you. Um, I can't really... You need to put your uh, elbows, uh, just rest them in front of you on the table, on the desk. Uh, I can't really do it because... I have a small desk and my keyboard and my microphone is in the way, so just visualize, just imagine <laughs> that uh, my elbows are resting here. And what we're going to do is we're going to close all our senses with our fingers, okay? And when we close them, uh, we're going to do certain breathing, uh, and it's just, it's really simple. So let me show you. You're going to put your thumbs into your ears, okay? And then put your uh, two fingers here, the two bottom fingers, your little finger and ring finger, and put them over your mouth. Uh, it doesn't matter how you put them over your mouth, just as long as your mouth is closed and... Uh, you know, they can be uh, like that, sealing them, or just like this, um, or like this. It really doesn't matter, okay? Like with all of these kind of practices, don't overthink anything. Okay, so these over here and uh, your middle fingers are going to close your nose. Uh, your index fingers are going to close your eyes, so... These are all the senses of the face closed, okay? So, once they're closed, uh, you're going to inhale. Now, of course, the, these fingers are going to close your nose, like so. However, obviously, in order to inhale, we're going to open your... Uh, we're going to open our nostrils when we inhale. And when we retain, we close them. And obviously when we exhale, we just open them. Uh, we're going to retain uh, for really as long as you can. The practice is taught in the Gnostic teachings uh, that you count to 20. Mm, but I'll do, we will do 10. Okay, uh, because I think 20 might be too difficult for some people, but the idea is you inhale uh, very slowly, as slow as you can really, and then you exhale very slowly. So this exercise gets our mind into a very still state, and we really can just do this for as long as we can until we uh, start to feel very still and we start to, you know, start to see some colours. The colours can be swirling around. Uh, the colours may not be very distinct right away, so uh, just keep looking very calmly and just kind of use your intuition. Uh, don't let your mind try to think or grab or feel like it has to imagine anything. They will just appear. So I'll do it now so you can see. Elbows resting. And I'm going to inhale, counting to... 10. You don't have to count, uh, just kind of breathe for as long as you can, really. So, I'll show you now. And then I'm going to retain. Nice. 
Now, you don't need to retain for a while when you first start. Just exhale very slowly as well. And again, you can do this cycle to just get you ready, kind of in a relaxation, uh, meditative way. Okay, breathing in for 10 to 20 seconds. Okay, I'm just doing it relatively fast. Doesn't matter how long you retain. Okay, exhale. Do that for as long as you can. And then when you really want to try and see the colors, when you inhale, retain for as long as you comfortably can. Don't, you know, stress yourself out. Don't get tense, but just do it in a relaxed way. And uh, when you need to inhale, just do the, the long exhale and the inhale again. So, like so. And while I'm retaining, I'm just looking into the blackness. Just keep looking into the blackness, intending to see the colors swirling in your vision. And then you may see some colors coming. So I'll do it just one more time to show you. Okay, I had to stop recording there because uh, I just could not relax, not in this position holding my arms up like this. It was just not comfortable at all. So I went into another room to do it on a table and I had to devote more time for relaxing. So I think I... I did the breathing for about maybe five to ten minutes, uh, especially because I've been doing this video for uh, over an hour now. And, uh, you know, I have some kind of pent up uh, nervous energy there. So I really needed to just, you know, bring my mind to a stillness and feel some deep relaxation within me. So I just I didn't focus at first on looking at any tattoos or anything or any colors and I didn't retain for very long. What I first focused on was the uh, inhaling as slow as I could and then exhaling as slow as I could and really just getting into that very slow still rhythm and eventually when my mind was more serene and then I try to look for the colors, I'm not trying to control anything, I'm not expecting anything, just looking and sort of connecting my mind uh, with the knowledge of these tattoos to, you know, thoughts attract things, right? But not trying to control anything, not desperately looking, just seeing. And eventually, through the stillness and you know, by that time I start to uh, retain for longer, uh, then I could start to perceive movements of colours. Uh, and when you see them, they're very still, they're very slow, usually. Uh, and that's why your mind needs to also be very slow and still. And the breathing needs to be still. Uh, so the first uh, color that I saw was Akash, black. Uh, so, and it's early morning here, so that was uh, kind of expected. And uh, yes, I saw a lot of uh, black. Now, obviously, uh, when you close your eyes, it's black, right? But when you see Akash, it's a very defined uh pitch black. Uh, it's blacker than the black behind your eyes. <laughs> okay, uh, so I saw that and then I also saw white. 
not as much white, but I saw white, which is uh, water, a pass. And then I saw uh, just a bit of blue moving around. So uh, it, I think it's been, it was uh, raining a little bit today. And um, so maybe that's why uh, that's uh, Vayu. Ah, okay, sorry. Yes, Vayu is air. So I guess I don't, it has been windy today, but it always is in this country. Um, it's quite kind of frosty and raining. Uh, that could be why I don't really know exactly why, you know, what tatwas always appear, but it's usually to do something with the weather as well. In the summer, there's always a lot of uh, Tejas fire. So, yes, um, feel free to pause the video if you like and try it yourself. If you need any clarification, just ask me. Okay, so, so if you were successful with that, comment down below what colours you saw. If you didn't see anything, don't worry, you probably just need to try again at another time and perhaps commit more time to relaxation beforehand. I'll probably publish the guided meditation based on this third eye episode in a few days, so perhaps try the exercise after the meditation since you'll be in a more relaxed and ideal state for perceiving these tatwas. When my Gnostic teacher showed me, I think that we were in a group of uh, maybe seven, and I think uh, only four out of seven saw colours. So yes, I, I think quite a few of you should be able to see something. We also have a live guided meditation and Q&A this Sunday in our Patreon Discord group, which we have twice a month currently. So if you're interested in joining, please go ahead and feel free. The link is in the description below. We have quite a few people joining now, so you won't be lonely. Okay, and uh, since so many joined this week, I'm just going to put your names on the screen instead of me reading them out as I usually do. Uh, thank you everyone, and as usual, feel free to ask questions below. Be sure to do the guided meditation in a few days, and then we will move on to episode 8, The Crown Chakra.